study the book of Psalms <clears throat> as we rush madly forward like a herd of snails. <clears throat> but the good news is <clears throat> we are to verse 4. Because last class you thought we finished with three, <laughs> and we didn't. <clears throat> All right, let's read it. Psalm 1, verse 4, the ungodly are not so. Not so, the ungodly. The ungodly are not so. Now this is significant because here is the deal. Uh, Yes, it says the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. What you have to see in that verse is when it says the ungodly are not so, he's talking about they're not like verse 3. <coughs> and here's the contrast. Those who are, uh, you know, in Christ, those who are one with the Lord, they're like a tree. Those who are not, they're like chaff. Those who are are like a tree that's planted. The ungodly are not so. They are like chaff blown by the wind. That's the contrast. The ungodly are not so. <clears throat> and so you can say this. <clears throat> Anything that is not Jesus or one with Jesus is not so. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, this, this whole thing is, is real simple. You could simply say that the righteous is always Jesus and the ungodly is us unless we're joined to Jesus and then it's Jesus in us. <laughs> right? <clears throat> if we live as separate, and that can be, folks, you can, live, you, can, you can live separate from the Lord and not be separated from the Lord. <clears throat> what do I mean? Separate speaks of union or lack of it. Separated speaks of, well, you're, you are a believer, you believe in the Lord, you're not in union, you don't function in union, but you, <clears throat> um, but you believe in him. So you're not separated from him because you are, as it were, a believer. And I say that because I think that the vast majority of Christians base their relationship on not being separated from God because they're believers, not on not being separate from God. <clears throat> because union is what God intended all along. And um, it's our only hope, frankly. It's our only hope. In other words, being a believer means you believe things. The Christian religion is not enough. That's not being like a tree. <clears throat> That's not being like a branch. That is believing things about God. You know, you say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So does the devil. I believe Jesus died on the cross. So does the devil. I believe, you know, we can go on and on here, <laughs> you know. I believe he rose from the dead, so it is the devil. I believe he's king of kings and lord of lords. Well, the devil may believe that, but in reality, he thinks he is. <clears throat> but the point being, we have the capacity of being joined. <clears throat> the devil has no capacity for being joined. And so, but, but, we talked about this in another class at another time recently, but we also have free will. And I believe that we can choose to live 
at one with him in union by his life joined whereby his life is the tree planted by waters and we are his branches. <clears throat> or we try to be a tree planted by rivers of living water. We copy him. <clears throat> and uh, the Bible just says the ungodly are not so. Anything that's not Jesus you say, well, what about the good people? Well, anything that's not Jesus. What about the religious people? Anything that's not Jesus. You know, I was uh, thinking about this today, how when I first came to the Lord, within my first year, I began to discover this reality of being crucified with Christ. <clears throat> and my understanding wasn't very deep. It was simply this. Um, draw it up here on the board. Just... Plain and simple, this reality of Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ lives in me. <clears throat> I began to, as much as I knew how walk in this reality when I first heard it, because it was like for me, incredibly good news. But I didn't, for, it, was, it was years later that I began to realize that through the cross the devil was dealt with. Uh, what does it say in Hebrews 2.14? That through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. Um, knowing this, that the old man, the old man, the old nature is crucified with him. I am crucified unto the world, and the world unto me. That's a, the world is a category. The devil is a category. The old nature is a category. The flesh is a certain a aspect of the category. The soul is another category. You can go on and on and on and on. <clears throat> the law, I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to the law. And, and, and all of this, all of this, I didn't understand. All I understood was I'm dead and anything that came out of me that wasn't Christ, <clears throat> I, I'm dead to it. I didn't have explanations. So I didn't know if it was, the, I mean, if the devil rose up in me and went, you know, or my soul said, ah, or the old man said, aha, or, you know, on and on and on. It didn't matter what rose up. If I knew it wasn't Jesus, I reckoned, I'm, I believed the cross concerning it. I mean, I, I didn't get into all the details of it. I didn't need to know it because all I knew is the ungodly are not so. He is so. He is that way. He is the only one that I can allow to live. <clears throat> you know, uh, in the old days when people would do deliverance, uh, there was this line of thought that you couldn't cast out a demon unless you called it by name. This was actual teaching. <clears throat> you had to know its name, you know. And I remember sitting in on deliverance sessions where the leader of the thing is going, you know, what is your name? What is your name? And I'm thinking, you know, I don't want to know his name. You know, what are we trying to get friendly here? I just want him out, you know. In the name of Jesus, come out. And that was the approach. See? And I didn't care, you know, I didn't care if his name was rejection or murder or Bob, uh, you're coming out in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> and, but see, with us, we get into all of that. We're like that in a certain sense. We've got to name it. We, we need to name it. Well, what is it? Is this the flesh? Is, is this my flesh or is this the devil? Anybody ever go back and forth? I, I don't know what the... Well, the question isn't, is it the flesh of the devil? The question is, is it Jesus? Amen. If it's not Jesus, go to the cross, take it to the cross, let it die, and don't hold on to it. But the devil gets us on these, this, these hamster wheels where we think that we've got to get it all figured out. 
And the cross is the cross is the cross. It is the center point of the plan of God. It is the fullness of time. It is the settled fact in the mind and the heart of God that everything after that cross is either dead or Christ. And you and I are one with him, yes, but we're one with him like a branch to a tree or a vine, so that we are drawing not just water from the rivers, we're drawing in the sap of the one that we're joined to, the life force, the life, because the sap is the life <coughs> of it. The way you can see that is if you ever see a dead branch, it could be, it could be dead and still have leaves on it. Did you know that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can, but does it have sap in it and if it doesn't it's dead it's dead and so for me I want to you know the ungodly are not so well I don't I don't need to know what the ungodly are so if I can find out if I'm in that category or not I mean I don't need to get into all that all I know is Jesus isn't this way and I'm one with Jesus you know I don't need to know how good I'm doing this week I need to know where my heart is, and where my faith is, and my faith isn't that Jesus can deliver me. My faith is that I'm one with him. I don't need to know if I'm going to make it or if I'm going to be deceived and carried away and the devil's going to, you know. You understand what I'm saying? I, I, I don't need, I'm not worried about that if my concern, and I do have a concern, my concern is that I keep my faith in the, uh, my identity with Jesus, no matter what, no matter what. Because you remember the parable of the sower? Well, it was the word that was sown, and what did the devil come try to steal? He didn't come try to steal you. You know, he didn't put a bunch of yous in the sack and run off, sheep stealer. <clears throat> he came to steal the word. He stole the word out of their heart. And that word has got to be by faith and it's got to cling. You know, that's what a wife does, you know, and a husband does too. Cling to one another and you hold on. And so, you know, the ungodly are just not so. I, what does it mean, not so? You know, you can, in that sense, you can go, well, what does that mean? So I can categorize myself. It doesn't matter. Jesus is all that the Father wants. Well, what does that mean in terms of doing the right stuff? Tell me, tell me, tell me. List. Give me a list. You know, I don't need a list. I need the person of Christ. I cling to the person of Christ. And I, I trust that all the doing will come as a result of being. Being one. You know. And if I see something, if I see something come out of me that is contrary to the one that I'm joined to, I reject it as dead. Because remember, you didn't grow naturally into this vine. You were grafted in. By, the, by what? By the cross. Cut out of Adam, placed in Christ, and now the life-giving force that is Jesus fills you. And so all the worrying, all of the concern, all of the fears, all of that <clears throat> doesn't go with Jesus. You know, when Jesus would show up, every time he would see his own, he'd say, fear not. That used to, in the early days, really bother me. It used to bother me. Here's why. We're all fearing. We're all in the upper room or wherever. You know, we're fearing. All this is going on. And Jesus shows up and goes, fear not. Well, why? Sure, you can walk through walls. You've got nothing to fear, dude. They're going to come down and break down these walls and kill us. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it used to really bother me that he would say, fear not, as if, you know, I could just come up to somebody who's in fear and go, oh, fear not. In almost 40 years 
of serving the Lord, I have never walked up to somebody and said, fear not, where they just went, oh, okay. <laughs> Good idea. I don't know why I didn't think of that. You know. <clears throat> Jesus says, fear not, meaning he's not afraid, and we're one with him. You know. If, if the answer was an explanation, he would have given it. But the wording is, I'm not afraid, so don't you be afraid because we're one together. But the ungodly are not so. Now you say, and here's, here's the common thought pattern. Well, I'm fearing, so I must be the ungodly. Okay, at what point are we going to believe the cross? At what point are we going to believe the resurrection? Because if you don't believe it, folks, you got nothing. You're an Old Testament Jew at best. Really. You're just, you're believing stuff about God trying to stay saved. By what? By believing or staying away from fear or doing the right thing or worshiping God in a manner that pleases him. I won't say anything much about it, but I was just enjoying the Lord today searching the scriptures and just seeing a certain aspect of something that I saw came by life and we try to make it a law. We try to make it a rule or a law or, or something and so consider a branch that has been grafted into this tree this Jesus, this one that is so, and everything else is not so. He is in that tree, and yet he, it takes a while for it to catch. Did you know that? It takes a while for it to catch. And I've told a little bit of this story before, but when I was a missionary in Jamaica, I saw a Jamaican doing some grafting, and I asked him to teach me because I thought, man, I need to see this done. And, and so he pulled out a knife and he wounded the tree, cut it open. Cut, he actually cut, it was an upside down cross, but he cut a cross in it like this, peeled back the bark, took the, uh, the branch, and he went over to another tree, cut it out, brought it over, peeled back where he'd made the wound, put us in the side as it were, folded the bark back over it, and he, he used just some like plastic, like a plastic bag or something like that, and he took it and he wrapped it real tight around that. Held it up tight. He said. <clears throat> and, and so he said, well, he said, now it's up to nature if it catches. He said, he said, we'll come back in a couple of weeks and, and see, okay? Well, you know, I was 21, and a couple of weeks didn't sound good to me. Yeah. So I came back, and I'm looking at it, and I'm trying to peel, push back the plastic. Is it, you know, am I going to see that it's catching, you know? Is, is it, you know, is it okay? And... Uh, Hopefully, at that moment, I thought about what I had done to the, the little chick when I broke it out of its egg, and I said, <laughs> maybe I need to let this thing go. But I kept coming back every day waiting to see because I knew once he took it out of the other tree, it lost its life connection, you know, out of, out of the old man, out of Adam. It had lost its life connection, and if it didn't catch it would permanently die. There's another death when it went through that cross and was connected in, and that is a death to everything that its old life brought forth. Two different kinds of death, though. One is absolute death from which there is no resurrection, and that is if it doesn't catch in Jesus. If it doesn't make that, if it doesn't, Make, and that's what abide means. If it doesn't make that connection of union, that's all. Abide is just a connection of a union. If it doesn't make that, 
then there is a death, but it's not the death of the cross. It's just the death, you could say the death without the cross on a certain, in a certain sense. But if it does make the connection, it died to the old and is now alive to the new. But it did die to everything that was inside of it. All the fruit that it used to bring forth. All of that. But one thing I noticed when we finally did come back a couple of weeks later and it started looking like it was catching. I noticed, you know, I could have said to the guy, now, you know, it's been a couple of weeks here. How come there's not a big, this was an orange tree. How come there's not a big orange on this? You know, in fact... Now that it's in the true vine, why, aren't, why isn't it just burdened down with incredible fruit? If I had asked that, you know what he would have said? Man, give it some time. <laughs> you know? And, and, and I say to you, give it some time. Give it some time. Okay? The most important thing is not the fruit. The most important thing is the abiding. Check it out. Uh, John 15. If you abide in me, you'll bring forth much fruit. That's the order. Now, where does, where does our minds wander to? It wanders to the fruit. I want to see Jesus. I don't, you know, it's, it's kind of this, I want to see Jesus, I don't want to see me. If you don't want to see you, every time you see you, say, that did die. It's not going to die. I'm not going to kill it. It died with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I believe that. And, because it says, um, he who is dead is dead unto sin, and it, and it talks about that. But it says, and alive, and it, well, it says this, reckon yourselves also to be dead but that reckoning is based on a finished death. The reference there is referring back to the verses before, all of which are a finished death. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. And then it says, and see, I, you know, I say, the, the scripture says there unto sin, but remember, that death took care of the devil, didn't it? It took care of everything. In a certain sense, I mean, you wouldn't use this word. It's not the most correct word. But in a certain sense, you can reckon yourself dead to everything. Paul said, I am crucified unto the world, and the world unto me. I mean, you can reckon on that the cross did a work. Amen? The proof of that is not how you act. The proof of that is the cross that you hold in your heart and see in your spiritual eyes. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. And so, you know, the reason why we have problems, and we all have problems, the reason why we have problems is because we can be shook by our circumstances. And it is truly our circumstances that shake us, either outwardly or inwardly in the sense of what we do, and then we get shook by that. But those things don't prove the cross. Did you hear me? Those things don't prove the cross. The cross is settled. Jesus died and he rose again. He's not going to come back and die again. You're either going to reckon on the original one or... or you're going to wait for something to happen. You know, you're going to wait for him to die again, as it were, you know. And remember, he says over there in Romans 10, he says, say not, you know, 
the, let the Lord descend down or you know, rise back up again. But the word is nigh thee. It's in your mouth and in your heart. I remember when I read that and I went, well, that settles a lot right there. This reality, this gospel, this truth, and that's what he's talking about, the gospel, is so near me, it's in my mouth and in my heart. It's, I noticed he didn't say, now the word is nigh thee. It's, it's closer than what you're trying to get even him to come down into your circumstances or a resurrection to happen. It's closer than that. The word is nigh thee. It's in your Bible and in your head. No. He said it's in your mouth and in your heart. Make sure it's in your mouth. Because, you know, you can, you can sit there and say stuff contrary to the truth if you want. But I'm on a search right now where I'd like to eventually deal with that, that area in a real full way and will. <clears throat> but I'm telling you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. And here's the key is it's in your heart. He says it's in your heart. He says this thing is settled. It's, this reality is not a doctrine. This cross, this, this reality that Christ is now your life is not a doctrine. It's not meant to be a doctrine. It's not meant to be what we teach. It's not meant to be, um, uh, like Jennifer said, it's not meant to be the stronghold of the truth of Christ in you. We're meant to be a habitation of God. That's no doctrine. That's God's reality. And he says it's in my heart, and my head says, uh-uh. And I say, uh-huh. Why? Because of all the proofs. No, I choose to believe God over anything else. I choose to believe God. What God says about, I'd rather believe what God says about me than what I say about me because I don't say very nice things about myself, you know. I mean, I choose. I have to. I must. You know, Jesus might have said, I must be about my father's business because I love my father so. I say, I must believe this because I have to. If I don't, I slide back into the slime pit and the sewer of fallen humanity. Crossless humanity. And, you know, you can do that just about every day. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff, it says in verse 4. They are not like the tree. They are not like the tree planted. They are like the chaff driven by the wind. Chaff is basically worthless, intrinsically useless. You, do you have your hand up or is, okay, I couldn't tell. I thought maybe you're waving at me. Hi, how you doing there? Yes, speak. Well, and some people may deceive by may be be deceived by certain ways of things. I mean, I've been I've been walking in this quite a few years, 
And so many times my desire is that it be Jesus, meaning Christ come out of me. Do you understand what I just said? Christ coming out of me. But for years and years and years, that could not be my first embrace. For years, in the early days until a certain juncture, it had to be not that it must be Christ coming out of me, but it must be that I am in union with Christ and I know that and live that and walk that. And that is the real test, the trying of your faith yes. that when, the, when you go with the Lord over this instead of how you look, feel, act, or whatever, that it is more precious to him than silver and gold. The trying of your faith. And the word trying there is passing the test. In that you believed in oneness. Yes. Yes, it is. Right. That's right. <clears throat> well, I think it's interesting there in Colossians. I love, I love the wording there. It says, if ye, or since you, this is the real word. If, in King James it says, if you be risen with Christ. The actual Greek there is, since you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above and not on things on the earth. Um, for ye are dead. But then just a few verses down from there, it says, mortify therefore the deeds of your flesh. So here's the picture. Uh, this is going to be more of a visual than anything else. Set your, thing, your affections on things above, for you're dead. Uh, mortify the deeds of your flesh. You know, when it says, set your affection on things above, you're looking above, and you don't get two verses down that it says, mortify the deeds of your flesh, and you look back down. But that's not what it's saying do. It's saying, look at this reality that is above, of that you're dead and Christ is your life, and based on that, I am dead. That's mortifying. You're not killing your flesh. It's already dead. You know? But it's mortified by you. It's kind of like taking the cross and swinging it until all flesh is dead. But, but the cross you're swinging is the cross of faith that it's already dead. It's, in other words, it's kind of like David going out against Goliath. He already believed that that guy was defeated. He said, and he said it, you uncircumcised Philistine, what are you doing standing on God's property? God has promised that you cannot stand here. That you cannot stand here. Let's see, where does it say that? Uh, uh, verse 5, therefore the ungodly shall not stand. <clears throat> and so David comes out there and takes his little sling and whap, knocks him down. And it was a fulfillment of what God had said way earlier when he said the uncircumcised will not be able to stand. This is true over and over and over and over and over. There, I could give you so many examples. Um, most of you that have been around here any length of time, you already got all this down, but we got new people here that need to hear it over and over and over until it becomes life, right? It's about life. It's, it's, it's not about believing the right doctrine. And here's why I say that. I've seen a lot of people come and go and get the right doctrines from this place and not get the life of it. And therefore, when they got out there on their own, man, the enemy came in like a flood and just bowled them over. And they couldn't, they couldn't stand in the truth because they didn't, get, they didn't get established in it when there was an environment that kept the enemy off long enough. So, 
Uh, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff driven with the wind. Driven with the wind. Not planted, driven with the wind. Not tree, but chaff. And like I said, I mean, chaff is basically worthless. Worth, worthless. It's dead. It's without substance. It's, it's easily carried away. Easily carried away. And, you know, this is, the funny thing about the chaff is that it thinks it's in control. Really, I'm serious. Because I'm not going to go to that cross. If I go to that cross, it's going to take away all my control. Anybody ever thought that thought before? I definitely did. <clears throat> so you, there's this thought that if I remain... We don't use this word, but if I remain chaff, I'll be in control. But the very truth of this says the tree is in control more than the chaff is. The chaff is driven with the wind. It's not in control. It's controlled by whatever moves into its realm and moves it away. Uh, I'm reminded of in Ephesians somewhere it says... Uh, you know, be no, be no more children tossed to and fro and driven by every wind of doctrine. <clears throat> the same sort of concept of just, you know, just anything that blows in. You don't have any roots. You don't have any foundation to hold you, you know. Uh, what's the old saying? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. <laughs> it's a good saying, but, you know. You know, the only thing that's going to make any difference is that we get rooted and grounded in Christ. <clears throat> and so, uh, the chaff thinks, and when we say chaff, that which is not Christ, then godly or not so, that which is not Christ, thinks that it will be okay, but its end is that it's going to be driven away. No, I'm, uh -uh, I ain't driven away. I'm leaving. No, because there's another, there is another explanation of the wind, and that's the Holy Spirit. Right? Driven, and the wind driveth away. The wind drives it away from what? The wheat. The wheat. Because that's what, that's what a threshing floor is. Did you know that? That's what a threshing floor is. is this, it's this big floor. And they take the wheat and they have these winnowers and they throw it up in the air and the wind blows the chaff away. And, then, and the Holy Spirit, the wind, and so, and you see, the, 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 the tear, I mean, the, the, the uh, wheat stays. It doesn't go. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a point here. The chaff is driven away. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Keeping your place here, uh, let's look at that scripture that talks about that. It's over in Matthew. Matthew 13. And let's see. Verse 24. And there another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From where then hath it tares? He saith unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up the wheat with them. 
Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so all of the congregations that are on this earth are mixed okay. when it comes to the earth mixed there's there's a mixture within them and the tares grow with the wheat and you know but still in Matthew let's look over in Matthew 25 let's look at another picture of this Matthew 25 verse 31 when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all the nations and, the sep uh, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left so here's another picture <clears throat> And I, this, is, this, is a, this is my personal belief, and that is that the sheep live as one with the shepherd. And the goats don't, and that partially, partially if I just went by having tended, I've never tended sheep, but I've tended goats, and they don't, you know, you can walk before them and they'll go, what does he think he's doing? You know, if you want to get the goats follower, follow you, you have to get what's called a Judas goat. And that, in, in, when they would slaughter goats, they would have a Judas goat, and that goat would be one that they would follow, and they would, uh, it would lead it, and it would lead them into the slaughterhouse. And that's a true thing, and that's an actual thing that takes place, and also does that with sheep, too. Sheep will follow a Judas goat. Pardon? Judas goat. Just simply because, pardon? It's the one they can convince to lead and all the others will follow it. <clears throat> and so, um, so I believe that, that this teaching right here isn't <clears throat> really a parable. The other was a parable. He said another parable put he forth about the chaff and the wheat. <clears throat> and that is, in, I'm going to put it on this front because this is seen up in, in heaven, okay? Uh, that one is seen on the earth. While it's growing together in the earth, in the congregation, there's going to be mixture. But in the heavenlies, there's a dividing that's always going on that God separates the sheep from the goats. I mean, there is, you know, th there is no way. Let's say I, I wrote it somewhere in my notes to, here. Uh, goats cannot live in Christ. They, will, they would be out of their element. As a fish cannot live in a tree. I know, one of my weird examples. But I mean, that's a good example to show us that's absolutely ridiculous. But we say that goats cannot live in Christ. So here's, here's, our, here's our picture. We draw the circle on the other side of the cross. And we say if you're in there, you can live in there. And we can see how a goat could live in there because to us that's like a congregation but in reality that is not a very good picture at all of being in Christ the, you know the best picture would be you know being some sort of a you know a tree and that we are a branch in that tree and we're drawing the life the sap out of the tree a goat can't live in there if you understand what I mean if a branch is like a sheep it draws life from it but a goat will never draw that life that's lamb life. A sheep is, a, they're all of the same family. You understand that? It's not goat life. 
right? What do goats say? They butt. It's always butt, and they're always butting, and they're always bad mouthing, bad mouthing everything. I'm, t- I'm just telling you, you know, these are all, you know, cute sayings and stuff like this, but I'm just telling you, folks, there's tares among us. There's tares in every church around, and you can tell what they are not by the tear consistency, but by the goat consistency. Hmm? We, we don't think much of that, or we think, you know, here's the way I used to be. I didn't see sheep and goats. I didn't see wheat and tares. Well, we're all just Christians. You know. And you, you do realize, you know, if this is New Jerusalem, you're opening the door to every sort of evil thing. I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm trying to just paint a picture here. You know, somebody could actually be a goat. Somebody could be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Am I right or wrong? Forget here. Okay, when you go to another church, when I finally chase you all off, tell me if it's not true that there will be sheep, but they're not sheep. But if you go by what you see, but if you go by what's on the inside, because that sheep, you know, if, you're, if all the flock is sort of shuffling around and they bump into that sheep, he goes, Arr! and you go, my, what big teeth you have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mallory? Well, there is, there is, and because I know the Lord has given me patience with certain people for years and years and years and years, you know, and later, <laughs> yeah, but I, we've had way worse than you, brother, way worse, <clears throat> um, and there are people that are gone that I, I just, I wish they never were gone, you know, I mean, I, I loved them and just, but they weren't of us and that's all there is to it and and so so the only conclusion that a that a tear or a goat or a wolf in sheep's clothing can come to is that well you're just not accepting me you know if the wind drives you away that's not me and if every ounce of everything i've ever done toward you is love i mean i'm just being honest then you know as it were, if we all stand before the Lord, I'm ready. Are you? You know, that's, I mean, there's nobody here, and I'm, but I'm just trying to make a point. You know, all the, those people didn't come. But anyway, no, I'm teasing. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm only teasing. But, but I mean, there is that, this, this reality, and who's going to know how, you know, you or I have related to them? in the Lord. Who's going to know that but the Lord? That's why I say, I say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to stand before the Lord. I'm even willing, because here's the thing, here's something I've told Bible school students forever. Time tells everything. Time tells everything. You know, you give something long enough time, it'll show what it is. That's all there is to it, you know. All right, we're going to I, I'm going to just read the rest and then quit, okay? That way we'll be able to move to another psalm after this, all right? <clears throat> Verse 5. <laughs> um, back to Psalm 1. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now, it didn't mean that, that the ungodly won't be in the judgment. They just won't be able to stand. 
See what it says? Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In the congregation of the righteous. See, the Lord added to the church those who got saved. He didn't add to Christianity. To the congregation of the righteous. And then finally, verse 6, For the Lord knoweth, and that word knoweth, if you have a Bible that has the E-T-H on the end, that's not just King James English. That is there to show you that this is an ongoing thing with God. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Now, who do you think the way of the righteous is? Jesus said, I am the way. You know, you say, oh, he knows my way. Yeah, Jesus, you know. He's my way. He's my righteousness. He's my stand before God. He's my redemption and my wisdom and my sanctification, my justification. He is all of those things, and he's made that unto me by union, not just, you know. We are made the righteousness of God in union with Christ. He doesn't make you righteous apart from Christ because Christ is your righteousness. Okay, So... Uh, the Hebrew says, the Lord is knowing the way of the righteous. He is constantly looking on their way, yet the Lord knoweth it. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Not only they perish, but their way shall perish too. The way of the righteous is carved within the rock, but the wicked writes his remembrance in the sand. The righteous man plows the furrows of the earth, but as for the wicked, he plows the sea. And the place that knew him shall know him no more forever. The very way of the ungodly shall perish. His way of pleasure or pride or profanity or unbelief or persecution or procrastination or self-deception, all these things shall come to an end. God knows, and it's capitalized in my notes, the way. God knows the way. And he knows us when we are identified with the way and will not be moved from Christ. Not in our understanding, not just in our doctrinal beliefs, in our understanding, in, in the storm. I mean, this is where you've got to stand and lean into the storm and say, I am one with Jesus. I don't care what is hitting me. I don't care how hard this storm is. It does not change what God did at the cross and in the resurrection. And what he did was he made me one with him. So the, God knows the way. And he also knows, this is the way not capitalized, he also knows the way that seemeth right. And therein, you know, how much time we got left there? Eight minutes. Therein is the deception, folks. The difference right, right there. Uh, way and the way one capitalized on the resurrection side of the cross because it's Christ who is the way and one not capitalized and that one is the way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof is the ways of destruction what is the clarity of the difference? It's very simple. This way is a person, and union with that person is our only hope. Folks, if all we're left to do is just try to copy Jesus, we're in trouble. Okay. It's union with that person. This way over here, not capitalized, seems right because it's based on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Does anybody, does anybody, when you read, and it's like five times in Judges, but it's not just confined to Judges, it's also in, I think, Numbers and a couple other places, do you ever sort of just shiver when you read, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes? Does that it bother you? You just sort of go, oh, my God. Well, maybe you've never really looked at it. It says every man did that which is right. It didn't say they were doing evil. I mean, it's, it's bad, and it's written bad. It's, it's written to say, this is not good that every man's doing what's right. 
in his own eyes. Because he says, your righteousness is as filthy rags, not your bad stuff. I mean, you know, you know we, we think we'd have this figured out by now, but I mean, this is, this is the way that seems right. It, it seems, he didn't say, there is a way that seemeth wrong, and those wicked people that take it are idiots. He says, they're, they're going after the way they think is right. They're doing that which is right in their own eyes. Their righteousness is what they're centering on. And all of, the, all of those scriptures that bring out that reality that, you know, you know what did uh, David say? Man at his best is altogether vanity. You know, all of a sudden you realize, man, I better believe in this way, the, the way. Jesus says the way. I better believe in the union way. You understand what I mean by that? The way of oneness. Because if I don't, then I'm standing out there in my own righteousness. And how many of you think you, how many of you really want to stand before God based on all the good that you've done? Well, what, here was my thought before I came to the Lord. If I do 51% good and only 49% bad, I'm going to be okay. That was my thought. So I always tried to stay just slightly over the halfway percentile. Not much more because I figured one, I figured 51% is good as, is just as good as 95%. You're in. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying stupid stuff. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but, then I realized, you know, I was way worse than I thought I was, and I came to Jesus and asked for forgiveness because I realized I was probably like 75% bad and only 25% good. But after I became a Christian, I upped my good. I moved it 35, uh, 35%, 40% maybe, you know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe more than that. Maybe in my mind, I upped it to like, 60% or 70%. And then the Holy Spirit started speaking to me and saying, so you're doing what's right. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing what's right in your own eyes. Because what's right is not you doing the right thing. What's right is Christ and you being one with him. So your righteousness that you're offering me now and you're so proud of, you think that's going to put you over. And he said, when that is as filthy rags, and that's just the good stuff you got. <laughs> of course, most of you know the meaning of filthy rags there, but I mean, that's just, that's, so that's the good stuff you got. And that's when I went, you know what? There is a way that seems right to a man. It is a small, small way, small w. But it seems right because the knowledge of good and evil fools you into thinking if you got more good on your tree than evil, that God will accept it when he's saying, don't eat of the tree. He didn't say don't eat of the evil. So we, we fill up on the good, load ourselves down with it, walk into the Lord and go, look. He said, you hadn't been messing with that tree again. <laughs> no, no, not, no, not like Eve did. <laughs> and he would say, just like Eve, just like Adam, because I told you not to eat of it. There is a way, and it seems right, and I tell you what, all of your understanding and all of your own goodness will tell you you're doing the right thing and they're wrong. Jesus is wrong and I'm right. That's, what, that's the conclusion people come to. 
My conclusion is I am desperately wicked and separated and needy even when I'm at my best. I need Jesus and I'm not ashamed of it and I'm not ashamed to shout it to the world even though, and I'll close with this, even though people get mad at me for teaching this stuff and don't like me and call me a cult leader and it hurts my feelings to lift up Jesus so high that people call you a cult leader. <laughs> We're dismissed. Ha, ha, ha.